Good evening, folks, and welcome to what is our last online session of this program. Um, these have been an absolute pleasure to host and uh, to be able to invite a range of guests and friends to chat about their experiences within the creative community. Um, I'd first of all like to thank Chrisanna, Steve and Alex for the opportunity to do this. Um, it's been a big challenge to put myself in front of the camera, but uh, one that I've thoroughly enjoyed once the nerves started to settle down. Um, tonight, I have a very special guest um, that I've invited on to talk about his approach to producing music, his entry into the music scene, and how he manages a busy, busy DJ career with his other creative work. Uh, Henry Greenleaf is someone that I've admired for years, uh, firstly through his excellent work for one of my favorite record labels, Par Avion, and more recently as a collaborator with my record label, Redstone Press. Um, we'll be talking a little bit more about that later on. Um, but for now, Henry is a DJ, producer, sound engineer, and has recently found himself in a position of working creatively and creating work simultaneously. And we're going to dive into that this evening. So I'd like to welcome Henry Greenleaf. Hello. Hello. How's it going? Good. How are you? Yes, good. Bit of a bit of a rush to get home and then from work in time for this, I believe, for yourself and myself included. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the uh, the stresses of a busy life, huh? <laughs> The joy of a busy life. <laughs> yes, well, that too, that too. Um, so I've, as I kind of always do this, um, we start these sessions with a bit of context for those who are tuned in. Um, yeah. So I thought maybe you could tell us a little bit more about yourself than the brief intro I gave, um, how you became interested in music and kind of what you do currently within that. Okay, so I got into it because through my parents, really, mostly my dad, um, mm. really nerdily obsessed with like roots reggae like tubby and perry uh yeah. craft work knew what that him, him and my mum met in manchester in like 1983 ish and used to go to the hacienda a lot um wow. so i was really into like new order joy division all of the happy monday stuff especially yeah. like when they get a bit more clubby mm. um and one summer he forgot to get mum a birthday present so panicked and took me and my sister and mum to a music festival, I think I was about five, which and my sister was nine. Um, wow. And then we went every year for like the next 11 years. And we were just really lucky. It was a really good one. <laughs> wow, which, uh, which festival was it? It was called The Big Chill. And I got to see Joker and Benga, wow. Mala and Koki. Um, but then I also got to see like the Blockheads and yeah. Buzzcocks and Roy Ayers. Wow. Um, Leonard Cohen, but I thought that was a bit boring, so I went on. <laughs> as, a, as a child, yeah, I get that. I can get too that. Too young to jump to it now, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow, um, no, that's quite like a... a real mixed group of people. Yeah, I um, bet. And they'd have like a compilation. It was such a like humble festival at the beginning. They'd have a compilation CD of the people who were on the main stage. Um, so we just got introduced to all these weird people. We'd listen to all the CDs we bought throughout the year. And get there next year and we'd see like get the handbook and it would say Tonton's expanding headbands on. We're like, who the hell's that? And so these are like the engineers that used to um they used to take care of all of Stevie Wonder's Moog synthesizers when he got really into that. We we're like, oh. oh that sounds great. So I was really encouraged by my parents and their friends to like seek out the weird stuff. Yeah, and, I bet. And seek out the stuff that we're not familiar with. Yeah. As yeah, opposed to yeah, like, yeah. I think most kids, when they go to festivals, they're like 16, 17, and they're going because they know the headliners. Yeah. And they sort yeah. of ignore most other stuff. But yeah. you know, we, we were really encouraged to find the really weird stuff that we might not enjoy, but it'd always be like an experience. Absolutely. And then I guess through through doing that, finding what is some of the gems within that, you know, like the yeah. stuff that you would have never have, have heard otherwise. Never. Or well, dubstep. We would have never heard dubstep if... My mum hadn't been in the cocktail tent with one of her best mates. I was really bored and like sulked off. It's so, like, oh, what's going on over here? And it was Benga. And I was like, that was about 2007. So wow. I, I would have been about 11. Um, and wow. I was like, holy shit, this is, this is amazing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, I had no idea what it was. And I just got, um, my dad had just got a new computer for the house, which had Garage Band on it. Um, yeah. So as soon as we got back, as soon, well, when we got that computer, we made a track together. This was just after the festival. Him, myself, and my sister. And it was all like the rubbishy uh, stock loops of like funk guitars and drums and, you know, wow, wow, yeah. stuff. 
<laughs> and then but then the next day I did one on my own and then just I basically did one every day since um, wow but then I was I was really inspired by the prodigy because my uncle had given me a CD I was really inspired by whatever that dubstep stuff was because no one if you're at a festival no one goes like <laughs> cut the record and says by the way this is called dubstep yeah yeah and right you have no idea what it is yeah yeah but and I was like this tall and everyone else around me was like way taller <laughs> so I couldn't really see what was going on either wow it, the mystery of it, it must have just been that must have been such a like a kind of well not baptism of fire but in some respects just a completely overwhelming and like defining experience being in that moment and being so young and being surrounded by people and kind of like you say like kind of being on your own in that regard as well yeah and like hearing <laughs> the first time with fresh ears and not being influenced by anyone else around you just in you just found yourself there it was really nice um and it, it somehow it wasn't crazy overwhelming it was only at one of the smaller stages mm. um i think that's why i liked it so much so i didn't feel freaked out mm -hmm. although everyone around you is like doing this <laughs> you feel like these aren't threatening people these are really nice people yeah. everyone's smiling yeah. um the truth so yeah it, i was really lucky to get that and i think the last time we went i was about 17 16 um then we started trying out some other festivals but they all felt a bit weird compared <laughs> i guess you build up such a you build up such like a, a context with your family unit in that regard to that festival mm. then it, anything else is not going to hit the same regardless yeah, yeah. You, like you've you've so many shared experiences in that moment and it you can't you, like you say you can't really recreate that those moments in no, a new true. environment as much it's always going to be different anyway regardless um so what do you so like after the the kind of in it, well the, the influence of your of your folks and your sister and going to the big chill and whatnot then at what, at what point did you because you you found yourself going to university and studying but was that was that just a kind of really organic step to take from being so interested in music from an early age or would, were you considering other things so. or was it like a conscious decision uh, my parents were always like um there was never a question whether or not i'd go to uni they were always like oh you're going to uni mm -hmm. um and I, I knew i wanted to do music i'd been playing the guitar since i was about seven um because my godfather plays guitar and he i think he had bought me one um nice. It was like a super tiny <laughs> nylon string. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I'd had the same I'd had the same guitar teacher until I was 19, I think, from wow. seven to nineteen. So that was really nice. I did all the grades with him. Um, but they were rock school grades, so that's like a bit easy. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I don't um, I have no I have no no uh, no knowledge of this sort of thing. So it could, oh, you could just like, it was really difficult and I'd be like, Yeah, I mean, yeah, wow. <laughs> no, it's all like blues, it's all blues and funk, which is all right. Um yeah. Yeah, I did went like right through grade eight. Just missed a distinction. I got a merit, which I was annoyed about. Oh. Um, and then, yeah, we had. I went to a really small school, and if they were to offer the A level, there had to be more than three people in your whole year that wanted to do the A level, because there were only about twelve people in my year. Right. Um, not a set like the whole year. Yeah. Um, yeah. Really tiny school. But we can, we've said to him, like, we both do grades on our... He played the drums, I played guitar. There was no third person. And I was like, we really want to do this. We've got all the software. We've got all the know-how. Like, just... And you're the music teacher. Our class sponsor was the music teacher. So we're like, just right. let us do it. And we convinced him to do it. Um, and that nearly put me off it because it was all Sibelius and, like, perfect cadences. It was all writing out annotated yeah. notes on the computer. Okay. And I could do a bit of sight reading and I could... I could do interpretation where you hear it and you write it down. But just all of this stuff about perfect cadences and the theory, I really disliked because I wanted it yep. to be, um, I don't know, a bit uh, weirder. <laughs> a bit weir oh, yeah, a bit, a bit weir more exploratory and like DIY in terms of kind of making mistakes and just yeah. you know, yes, mistakes making mistakes and being limited by, limited <laughs> by the, the preordained structure of something and like the theory of it, I guess. You know? That's the thing. I didn't know the theory, so I couldn't be the clever clogs that was like, I know all of it and I still deny it. Yeah. Like, I didn't know any of it and I didn't like it. <laughs> yeah, fair. I mean, you can't deny that, can you, really? So so yes. then you, um, when we spoke last week, when we were doing a bit of prep on this, you mentioned it. So you, you took the dubstep degree. Now, this is something that uh, yeah. a friend of mine in Bristol uh, uh, amicably named, affectionately named it. 
um, because it's well known that there's been lots of people and peers of ours in, and, uh, well, as people that we're huge fanboys of have gone through yeah. and done that degree. But um, can you tell us a little bit more about it um, and whether your choice of, of, of university degree was in order to pursue a career or was it just because you had a passion for it at that time? I had a huge passion for it and I still yeah. do. Um, yeah. But because of the A-level where everyone was telling you how to do your cadences, how to do the theory, how to do the chords, I was thinking, I don't want to do production. I don't want to do anything like that. I want to do uh, sound design or sound art or mm -hmm. something where you just get to create something and no one tells you what to do with it. You, it's really free form. Mm -hmm. and I went to loads of open days and I'd go with, uh, sometimes with mum, mostly with dad. Um, I found this really great one in Brighton. It was because my sister went to um, art to do art at uni, like interactive mm -hmm. experience design or something like this. Um, mm -hmm. And both my parents were interior designers. So it's like a very arty house. Yeah. And I knew I wanted to do arty stuff at uni. So when I went to the open days for the sound art courses, they were all like falling apart, brick rooms like this, covered in paint. And I was like, this is great. This is where I want to be. Yeah. But then I checked their facilities and I was like, Whoa, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. Um, and that was looking for sound art and sound design and sound installation courses. Mm. And then my parents were encouraging me like, oh, you, you should try some uh, music tech courses or music production courses. And I was like, okay, I'll go check them. Mm -hmm. um, I think someone, my advisor at school was saying that as well. So I went to some in London, some in like, there's one called Canterbury Christchurch that was all right, one in Suffolk and Sussex and Falmouth. And all of them were like, hmm. Because I- Okay, but not, they're not ticking, you know, like not piquing your interest, yeah. No, it was really frustrating. I was loving everyone I was meeting on the open days. Um, some of the open days were cool enough to say, to sit you down in a computer and say, right, here's what we'd be doing in first year. And it mm. was really basic, like tragically right, okay. basic. And it put me way off it. And then I went to um, to Bath Spa and clocked it. It's right next to Bristol. And I love music from Bristol because I also saw Joker at the Big Chill and he was from Bristol. Right. And that year I actually had the pamphlet and I was like, Joker, dubstep, Bristol. And I was like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> ah, <laughs> yeah, it's my the homework. <laughs> Then yeah. I had everything he had ever released on my iPod. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, all his remixes were amazing. Yeah. Um, and then that summer, I just bought the computer output loop dance, something like that, which is the first Cold Recordings release, which is Pinch that does Tectonic had started a yeah. second label. And that compilation had Batu on it, had Asusu on it, had Ip Man, had uh oh shoot there's a there's quite a few really cool people on it and it's yeah. the first time i've heard batsu um and then from finding out about bristol dubstep and watching i was so into scream and venga i've watched yeah. all the dubstep documentaries on youtube and they would always talk about people in bristol as well i was like there's really something going on in bristol and it's not a big city mm. so i thought if i go to bath spa i can basically pretend i'm in bristol because bath spa is on in between it's Bristol like, and Bath. Yeah, I, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's in the countryside. It's got loads of sheep and rabbits. And it's, it's really nice there. Um, I, was like, I can pretend I'm in Bristol and I can get in the scene there. Because there's not... London's like, where do you even start? It's so big. And there's mm. so many people here. But Bristol's got like a very small scene that's having a really big impact. And... Right. I was like, this is the more, right more tangible as a More tangible as, a, as something to kind of... Get your teeth into yeah absolutely I, yeah I, I literally thought like i could i could try to make my start here and then move back to london and that seems like far more feasible mm, mm, um mm. But i was really keen on the open day i was like yeah every lecture extra every <laughs> lecturer that was showing us around i was like is it true is that true as well Oh, wow. oh, brilliant. Oh, <laughs> I'm very wet behind the ears, Henry. I can imagine it. I can just imagine it. <laughs> so what was oh, the, the, uh, the, the, the really what was the degree cool like? Sorry, oh, say again. Lovely. The really cool thing was all of the lecturers, if you mentioned any of anyone's uh, producer names, they'd be like, oh, yeah, Jake. Oh, Dan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah right, they yeah. all remember them. 
Yeah. Some of those lecturers have been there for years. Yeah. That's a testament. I guess that's a testament to the quality of the course. Do you know what I mean? And the yeah. fact that they are feeling nourished in their work that they're doing as well. You know, like if they're, if they're there for a long period of time, it shows that they're enjoying their work, which means that then inherently is going to be a good output for the people taking the course. Yeah. Um, so yeah, cause I always, I've kind of always regretted my degree choice, even though it's now something I, I work within. Um, I'd always, I, you know, I'd always thought, oh, I wish I'd done something a bit more music based because by the end of my degree, I was, I was kind of tired of it and ready to like pursue music more in a, well, like, like more in a tangible, less in a passive way, I guess. Um, and was, was, what was your, yeah. So what was the degree like? Tell, tell me a little bit about it. Um, it was really wonderful and also a little bit weird. Um, okay. so it, it covered a lot of ground from like how to market yourself mm -hmm. to lots of production stuff, sound design for moving image, comp composition for moving image, video game audio, which I didn't do. Um, but yeah, you could, you could get more specific with what you wanted to do throughout mm -hmm. the years. Mm -hmm. So the first year I was having a wonderful time. I was learning how to mix uh, vinyl from this guy on my course called Jack. Um, mm -hmm. And I was hanging out with all the guys on the course. I quickly found who's making techno, who's making jungle, who's making yeah. dubstep. And I was like, that's my lot. Yeah. <laughs> um, and they were really lovely guys. Um, yeah. Then second year started to focus a bit more. and work, But the first two years were really easy. Like, yeah. The only challenging part was when someone would say, it was just the same as your A-level, they'd say, like, you've got to do this like this. And you'd be like, oh, but why? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> you lose yeah. Mark for sort of taking it and running with it. Mm, um, mm. But you always gained favor with the lecturers because they were like, you, you've handed in something interesting there. But it's not quite what we've asked for. So we're going to knock a few points off. <laughs> yeah. 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 But I, I mean, that's, yeah, that's, they say that those who, well, I mean, as a generalization, but the, sometimes those who like act out or are, yeah, like challenging the parameters of whether it be education or whatever are usually those who have a lot more to give and, and maybe are feeling less <laughs> engaged by it because they are feeling stifled by the parameters that are in place. But I guess they those parameters have maybe. to be in place as a generalization. I didn't, I wasn't too frustrating because every, everything, everything would be taught that I already knew I'd be like, well, this is okay because surely there's someone else in the room that doesn't know it. Yeah, right. Yeah. Just when I'm being taught something that I don't know, I'm sure there's someone else in the room that yeah. did already know it. Sure. Um, but I really didn't learn too much about production. Um, Interesting. I, like my practice didn't change very much. The stuff that yeah. I really learned was from other people on the course that would show you like yeah. the weird little intricacies of their process. Yeah. Um, like Sub Basics was in my year and he was telling me how much he hates like anything resonant in all his snares or hats or I was like oh what do you mean you get up like an EQ and duck out like all the bits you don't like and that's like that was learning a lot from just making yeah. tunes with the people on the course yeah um, yeah yeah that was really good fun and then we'd all like I told, well, I told you the other day we'd get um one of us had CDJs one of us had turntables and a mixer and then we'd borrow like the biggest speakers on campus and set them up in someone's kitchen and then like dj and my sister was doing the music video for tsvi so i had a brand new tsvi tune that hadn't come out and i was like oh yeah the guys are gonna love this <laughs> i'll really impress them with this um, we had an mc on our course we got him to mc a few times yeah and then we through connections on the course we started doing a few radio shows yeah which were like very few and far between and then i thought we'd start we should start a label Mm. And I did that with that guy, Jack Giovanni. Um, mm -hmm. So called the label Conduct. And it had like a square logo, which is because all of our stuff on campus was delivered by, what's it called? DPD? DHD? Yeah, 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 yeah. I took a picture of it and I was like, that would be good. <laughs> <laughs> and drew over it in Photoshop. Nice, nice. Yeah. <laughs> we have, yeah, we, we just put tunes out for free on SoundCloud and tried to get yeah. a bit of traction. Um, which we didn't really, but it was good fun, a good project. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a, like an in, it obviously influenced later work, which we'll we'll get onto. Um, but I thought what we can do is um, we'll break it up just now. Um, it's good a time as any to maybe give folks a better understanding of what you're into musically, like what your DJing style is like. 
Um, so I thought we could take a little break and um, show a little video. Um, could you give us a little bit of an introduction as to what this video is? Uh, yeah, this is the DJ clip, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So this was um, Agrippa and my record label, Paravion. We did a takeover of Pirate Studios with Rywax, at Rywax, mm. uh, about two years ago. And this is a part of my set that I thought went rather well, because <laughs> I was um, hitting the Q button, feeling like DJ EZ. And, <laughs> and it, it links in a little bit to what we'll talk about when we break down one of these tunes later. Yeah. Of just like really ducking and throwing filters and faders um, to make room and be a bit more dramatic. Cool. Well, let's let's kick it on and then we'll uh, we'll have a talk a little bit about Paravion and, and, and onwards. Cool. <laughs> Nice. Yeah, I like the uh, I like the little reference to EZ there. I could definitely see it. <laughs> but no, it's great as well. Like you're saying with the kind of like bringing in that low pass and letting it and letting that one come out, and then there's just being space completely for that vocal mm. to come in after a couple of seconds pause. You know, like that can that can be enough to cause people to be like, "What's going on?" And yeah, then it, you know what I mean, which is kind of what you what you're aiming for, you know, in that moment. That's what I'm aiming for, and yeah. especially within the tunes as well. Yeah. Um, because I, when I was at uni with these guys, I was making, I was determined to be on the Swan Petty One show because I was obsessed with uh, Pale Man and Lamont, yeah. and Lamont actually brought me on for a guest mix, like in my in the third year, and I was like, wow, yes. whoa, whoa. He's, really, he's a really lovely guy, um, and he let me press the rinse, button, <laughs> which felt brilliant. Wow, that is a rite of passage right there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so but, um, my no, my. Where, is what you can say sorry, sorry? <laughs> i was just gonna say that's exactly what i want to do in the tunes because there's a moment there where it goes completely silent yeah and i start giggling and doing some dumb face because a bunch of people in the front row started laughing and imitating like the weird synth sound that it made yeah. but everyone stopped talking and everyone really focused in yeah right and that's that's what i want to happen in the tunes like it sound it sounds like a total mistake when it goes quiet but yeah. if you if you know if you know that it's going to do that and you can have fun with it and you can put in a new beat and a new groove, like change tempo, no one's going to notice. Yeah. Um, if you just play rolling beats all night, you lose people's attention. But if you challenge them, then hopefully they won't just skulk off to the smokers and hopefully they'll go, <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's it. It's a bit like a sense of drama. Definitely. I definitely, when I'm playing, I'm trying to create something that will not necessarily jar someone but will make them go like oh wait what's going on you know like, yeah. if you, are, like you say like i because I, I that's my that's how i enjoy when i'm out dancing the most that's that's what i enjoy hearing the most so obviously i'm going to try and emu emulate it when i'm playing yeah. myself um so we talked very briefly earlier you mentioned par avion as did i um and this par avion for anyone who doesn't know is an independent record label that you work and run um, with your friends. Um, mm -hmm. How did that come around? And can you tell us a little bit more about it? So yes, it's Agrippa's baby, really. Um, through 
desperation to get affiliated with the Swamp 81 crew, I met um, Agrippa and Meta and Yak. We were all sending in tunes like as much as we possibly could to get them on the Thursday night show. Um, Because it was really cool. Pale Man and Lamont would just tweet and say, here's my email address, send tunes to everyone that Mm. followed them, Mm. which was really inviting. You didn't feel like you were pulling on their coat, like, please, please help. Um, (laughs) And then when the show was on, we'd all type in uh, hashtag Swamp81 and you could see the updates. And we'd be like, no way, is this your tune? Oh, this one's mine. What's this? And it was like a really nice community. Um, And then... Will Agrippa was the first person that ever sent me something they were working on just before I went to uni. Um, He had done an interview with Keep Hush and tagged Pale Man in it because he said Pale Man's like his biggest influence at the time. Uh, And I saw it because it was retweeted by Pale Man and that's how I found out who Agrippa was. Wow. So I didn't believe it because he had had done an interview and I was like, oh, he's doing really well. Yeah. And the first thing he did was I followed him and then he just sent me his tune. I was like, what do you think? And I was like, oh, amazing. Here's something I'm working on. What do you think? And then we just kept sending tunes back and forth. He went to school with Sean and Alex from Meta mm-hmm. um, and somehow knew Yak already and then Fox Mind and all the Circular Draw crew. Mm-hmm. Um, and I slowly met all of them because they'd come through Bristol. But basically, Will was determined to start a record label because he saw myself and Meta especially had, were sitting on a lot of music um that he liked and he wanted to put Mm. out Mm. um so we slowed down a little bit over the pandemic unfortunately Mm. and then got hit when we came back got hit with uh big pressing delays yeah yeah as we as as we we will talk about (laughs) (laughs) we are we are inhabiting the same space collectively it seems at the moment it's just insane i mean oh yeah sorry we're back with a fifth release from a guy in new zealand really lovely guy um at that pirate show i was feeling really happy and i went into the crowd and this guy introduced himself and was like oh i'm i'm from new zealand i'm going around england i was like oh you coming through bristol he's like yeah i might do i was like come and stay at my house (laughs) he came and stayed for a week um and he's a really lovely dude yeah and he makes fantastic tunes really freak out tunes yeah um so we got a four track from him I don't know if I'm allowed to say who it is yet, but I think so. Well, we can we can we can keep it under our hats if you need to. That's totally understandable. Okay, Um, but that's exciting. I mean, it is. It's it has been like you say this this kind of crazy hiatus for the last two years, um, where at one you know they didn't really like all the music with Paravion and with Redstone Press as well is definitely kind of orientated towards the club and if there's no club in which to really enjoy it it does it feels yeah. like it's not you know it, it wouldn't have felt as much of a wholesome experience to put out a record in that time mm. and then with the pressing plant delays with that um factory burning down that was like responsible for 60 percent of the acetate or something like that that's oh, wow. that was made um and then with social distancing in pressing plants and brexit and all sorts of sit down gigs myriad reasons for delays it just yeah has led to also your ep with us which is was due this time last year is yeah. now coming <laughs> next month and that is for the exact same reason it's these this one year essentially one year footstop to wait for everything to happen um, but what sort of with with Par Avion? What sort of work do you do with the label at the moment? And um, what have, what have you kind of learned from your experience with it? Uh, so Will wanted to do the label, but he didn't have any idea for art or a name. Um, but he trusted me to do that for some reason. So I came up with the name Par Avion quite quickly mm-hmm. because I had been uh, really nerdy, but I'd been sort of digitally collecting stamps um, from eBay, like screenshots. I thought they were fantastic. Not stamps like, um, my sister bought me some the other day, actually. I don't know if I've got them to hand. But if you think you've got, um, if you've got an envelope, it will usually have um, a stamp in the top corner and that stamp will be, you know, cut around the edge of the queen's face on it and pretty boring. But if you send something internationally, it has to be cleared to get into the country. Those authoritarian, authorizing rather, stamps, I thought were really cool. Right. And I found this one from uh, South Borneo that said passed for transmission and it was in a big triangle. 
Uh, and I thought that's really funny because if we did that, and also I think Will had said he wanted to do hand stamps to keep the price down. Yeah. And I was like, we can really lean into that. We could use all of these clearance stamps. We can pretend we're a post office. And part of the <laughs> transmission is like, this This stuff's good enough to go be transmitted on the radio. Yeah, okay. And I was like, ah ha ha. That's, that's clever. I like <laughs> that. I like that. Code. Yeah, and it's then got more was, it was just written on all the envelopes that I was looking yeah. at. Um, and it, when we thought, uh, when we're international megastars, <laughs> our DJ skills are going to have to be delivered par <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> brilliant. <laughs> no, I mean, I love it. I love it. I think that's, it's it's nice when it like organically happens like that from an interest as well. Do you know what I mean? Like rather than yeah, yeah. sitting down at a mood board and, and hashing it out over weeks and weeks and weeks, it's just it organically. And you, it, I, I don't know, like it, once it's set, it, it can it can take on other meanings as well as as the label grows, you know, like you have your own personal meaning for it and as will Will, and then you have your collective meaning and other people will interpret it how they interpret it um, as well. Um, so yeah, do you have um, the work, what is, what's the work that you do with Power Avion at the moment? Uh, so I do all the graphic design, mm -hmm. um, I did the name, and that's about it. Some very little stuff for social media sometimes, mm -hmm. like to promote a Bandcamp Friday or something. Mm -hmm. um, but the the way we do the artwork is we'll do we still do hand stamped, mm -hmm. uh, but now we do full sleeves as well. Oh, cool. So the first one we did a full sleeve on was my second EP with the label. So we yeah. got a little stamp in the corner, which yeah, yeah. says number four because it was the fourth okay. release. Yeah, yeah. And it's printed on like reverse, somehow like reverse sleeves, which makes yeah. it textury like an envelope. Mm -hmm. um, but the graphic in the middle is still hand stamped. So when we do a, a release, we've got like a clearance stamp that has the number of the release on it and the Brilliant. title yeah. and the artist's name. Um, so it feels like a continuation rather than uh, backing away from. Yeah. So the next one we've got, I actually had the guy... Um, he told me that he was drawing all these sigils that look a bit like runes. And he said he really wants to get them on the artwork. So the next one is like this really glitched out signet thing. Oh, signet. cool. Yeah, um, so, yeah. And then on the, what's it got on the back? On the back, I found this really weird website that lets you upscale an image, which is like, um, apparently on iPhones, the camera that we've got in the new ones is not actually much better at all than they were in the first ones. But the technology that upscales the image has got way cleverer. So oh, if you right. took a picture of your mate in the distance in the countryside, zoomed in on their face, you'd quite likely find that their face is really mashed up. Square. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, because it's like tried to recognize a face and done it incorrectly. So it's like all this upscaling technology that makes the images look better. And they filter them for you that makes it look like super oh. friendly colors. But on this website, I found this really, it was a stamp again of a bunch of leaves and it was super pixelated, whoever uploaded it to the internet, mm -hmm. it's awful quality. Um, so I put it through this upscaling software and it recognized all the pixels as the texture of a canvas that was painted on. So it made it look like a paint, a really high fidelity painting Wow. with really glitchy colors. Oh, cool. Um, which I felt pretty boffin to be able to do. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah so that's, on, that's on the back yeah. of the next one. <laughs> oh, excellent. That's very exciting. Oh, what, so when when is that one due? That's due... Oh, shoot. We've just had the test press delivered. Um, the pressing plant that does... The printing plant that does the sleeves, mm -hmm. they're really pernickety about the format that I submit the artwork in. And I submitted it the same as last time, but I think they've changed something. So I need to resubmit the artwork tonight. Yeah. Um, but what's the current wait? Is it something like three months? So it should be about yeah, three months so. from now. So, yeah, so... so I think we've just approved the test press. July-ish, August maybe, that era, okay. that time. Oh, that's exciting. That's cool. I'm looking, well, I'm looking forward to hearing it. Um, so let's move on and l have a little listen to a song from Paravion. Um, and this is a pick of yours, one of your favorites. Um, yes. Tell us who it's by and why it, why it stands out for you. Uh, this is by Big Bad Agrippa. And it just... I don't know. It's it's his attitude towards making tunes where he's a very quiet, reserved, cool guy. Mm -hmm. um, he's got a quite a high end job 
as a chemist in like a really big pharmaceutical lab. Wow. Um, so he's had a pretty mad previous two years. <laughs> yeah, I bet. I bet. Yeah. <laughs> um, wow. Which is a little bit more of the reasons for the delay in the label. Yeah, um, sure. But he's, it's not big pharma, but it's like, it's not small pharma. <laughs> <laughs> but I think he just, because he's got like a really nice way of living his life, he likes to really freak out on his tunes. Yeah. Um, all his tunes are just crazy dark and do really obnoxious stuff. And I just love it. So this one's yeah. called Spice Raiders. Yes. Um, and it's, yeah, the lead synth is just bonkers. Let's pop it on. Let's pop okay. it on. <laughs> That is brilliant. That is, yeah. I, I just before we before we move on, I also just want to say that Paravion is the only outfit that I have ever won a competition from. I remember entering oh, yeah. the competition a couple of years ago. This is before we'd even met, and like I knew about you, was a big fan of your music and what Paravion was doing. And I remember like this was just at the beginning of Paravion, and like Redstone Press kind of coincided at the same time. And I remember entering a competition. The only competition I've ever won, apart from a teeth whitening kit from the dentist. <laughs> and uh, and I got a load of stickers and the records. And I have them yeah, in the record boy. shelf. Actually, I should have pulled them out when that song was playing, but I forgot. But yeah, big ups to you for, for making me a winner. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I want to um, call a one competition to, for a free set of tickets to see Loafer and Code 9. Wow. But I was in Bristol, so I gave them to my sister. <sighs> I know. That's the only one I've won, I think. Damn, damn. Um, so obviously, um, you've you've 
had your, you know, your own creative productions and DJ career. I'd like to talk a little bit about that. I'm aware of the time, so and I would like to get on to talking a little bit about um, your your kind of full time day job as well. Um, yeah. but you've released on labels like excellent labels like Glass Talk, Paravion, of course, Version and Arts. Um, and I was just wondering if from like where you are now, if you had any advice you could give your younger self who is starting out making music with the mindset of I would love to. I would love to hear these released on such and such. If you would have any advice to give. Um, probably just to start going to nights more regularly in London. Um, mm -hmm. When I went to Bristol, the, my first week there, I went to see Pev and Batu at the first time dance mm -hmm. um, and went to everyone since with my mate Ed. Mm -hmm. um, and it was really nice because you could just walk around the decks and shake hands with Pev. Can't do mm -hmm. that in London. There's always like a barrier. And like yeah. very much that's the crowd this is the dj and there's yeah no yeah crossing that line um but i reckon if that was that was my mentality but i think if i had just started going really regularly to small clubs um f to fringe nights mm -hmm. that i probably could have made that connection in london and didn't yeah. have to wait until bristol yeah yeah o other than that just I would have told myself keep making tunes because eventually they don't sound terrible <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean i'm i'm deep within that in that right now i've just literally started a ableton course or just yeah just finishing a 10-week ableton course that i'm doing in person at a classroom and everything i make sounds awful but it's the <laughs> persistence to be like this is just because you don't understand how to use the stuff properly yet and it takes yeah. time and you have to like at a certain point it will a light bulb will go off um but you also as well, so yeah, we, I wanted to talk a little bit about your, your full-time work um, mm -hmm. outside of your DJing career and your, your sound production career of your own. Um, you're also working full-time as a sound designer. Um, oh, and great. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and how you got into that. Yeah, that was really bizarre. Um, my sister's boss's husband um, runs this studio called Coda's Coda. So she heard mm -hmm. that they were about to be looking for um a junior sound designer um and i said like oh let ask ask them for an application form or something and there were quite a few people applying and i knew it was good because you, the application process was to take one of their old videos redo all the sound design submit the project of how you've done it and you'd be paid for your time in all of that wow. and i was like oh they, wow. they're serious that's really good because i'd done some sound design stuff before Mm -hmm. um, and it, everyone's like the communication always breaks down because um, people don't really know what they want. Mm -hmm. um, and then if they do, like, it's not what you've done. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> um, but I got the job with these guys um, from just really doing like a whole week obsessing over this like one minute video, sending it to all my mates. Like, does it get dull here? Do I need to like make mm -hmm. that one? Is something missing here? Um, it was It was really good fun to do. Um, and I actually, I got it, not just because of that. That's what you were asked to submit. But I also sent them my art CP that was, I think, had just come out. Mm. Um, so I said, like, well, here, here's here's my best effort. But also, if you want to hear more of my sound design, here's my last TP. Yeah, right. OK, so and you're I like, that, I think that bumped me like, over. In respects, you know, yeah. I think that bumped me over because the, they really love techno and jungle and they're really into square pusher, which I just don't agree with, but everything else I'm really into. <laughs> you, can't, you can't have it all. You can't have it all. all. <laughs> yeah, they brought me on to do uh, music and sound design for a CBB series, mm -hmm. which I'm doing at the moment. All right. As well as some like short videos and adverts for mega projects in Saudi Arabia and Dubai, wow. which are like mega money. Not for me. Yeah. I get like a day rate. Yeah. But these projects are like just yeah. unbearable, okay. man. How how have you found how have you found kind of balancing uh, this this kind of like demanding day job with your own personal passion and creative career? Oh, it's been great. Um, yeah. It can, it's a little bit demanding because these are like nine hour days, mm. um, but I only do three days a week. Okay. Um, with a little bit of additional work, sometimes I do four days a week. Um, and I've, until last week, I had this crazy preamp that goes around your shoulder and this enormous fluffy microphone because we're doing an exhibit in, well, we're helping with an exhibit in the Design Museum. Um, I, can't, I don't think I can say what it's about. That's okay. But I had to get all these Foley recordings, which yeah. involved standing outside of like large events 
for three hours was like shivering cold holding this microphone uh, up. So it's not uh, all glitz and glam. No, no. <laughs> but still, like, it's really so. From I got brought on to do basically sound effects for a kids' show, which is like, but I get to use like their modular and their huge synths and their crazy equipment to do it. Wow. Um, and I get to keep the samples. Or they, they they sort of know that I'm nicking samples off them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and they think they I get, they're like that's okay. And they've even said I can use the studios after work if I want to, wow. which I've not taken them up on yet. Um, uh, but in, because the project was like mad delayed, um, mm -hmm. it was meant to start in October. I got the job in August. It was meant to start in October, early October. So I moved to London. That's, I moved to London for the job. Mm, mm. Um, stayed with my sister for like a week and then I only actually got started on the CBB show in like mid-December Wow! So I started there in late October and I was doing all these strange little adverts promotional videos um, and then I started doing all these Foley recordings and luckily it was a really basically it was a blessing that it was so delayed because I've now got a really huge portfolio from it as opposed to mm, just mm. one thing mm, mm, and loads mm. of experience yeah, I guess because you had to feel that you were filling the time with other stuff in the interim, yeah. right? Wow. Which is that that was just them being really nice and being like, you can yeah. help us out with this, you can help us out with this. So we talked last week um, about um, what actually piqued your interest in sound design. Um, and I was wondering if you could share that with us a little bit, because then that gives some context to the next portion of our well, discussion. Yeah, that was that, that, was that dude on Concept YouTube, sound right? Sound design, yeah. Yeah, yeah like Marshall McGee, I think he's called. Marshall McGee, that's who it was. What a right. don. <laughs> so he, my dad actually sent me a video that he had found that was uh, a clip from Star Wars. I think the second bad one that's got, um, it's got the seismic charge explosion, which yeah. we all obsessed about over at uni. <laughs> it's when something explodes and it goes like, bong, and it makes like a big synthesizer sound. So this guy made a video on YouTube saying, I'm going to recreate this from scratch using only my iPhone which was really cool. So he yeah. went around his house and he was like slamming his sliding doors, opening, closing his windows, closing his uh, oven door, like just silly stuff. Then then he showed you how he took all those samples, stretched them, processed them and compiled them in Ableton. Um, but because he's showing you all these layers, I was like, I'll have that, I'll have that, I'll have that. I was just sampling all the individual layers. Yeah, and I started watching all his other videos because I thought his sounds are really good. I can nick them all, um, and you know process them so no one will ever know. Mm -hmm. um, but one of his videos, he he did the sound design for Just Cause Three, so he's done. He's yeah, a yeah. professional sound designer that's done yeah, really yeah. good stuff, not just like a YouTube kid. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm with you. But he he did this one video talking about his Just Cause Three stuff, where he talks about hyper reality hyper reality mm -hmm. which is i think the way i put it to you the other day was like if, if someone gets punched next to you you just hear like uh, that's it but in a video <laughs> game you get yeah you get all these crazy sounds like yeah, wind and, added effects essentially yeah. yeah and all of that is totally unrealistic but somehow makes it seem more realistic right and yeah. also makes the punch seem like it hurts that much more so I was watching this and thought, that's what I need to do with my kick drums. Because mm. <laughs> I thought, they're not that massive, but I could make them seem massive by having all this, like, and really yeah. making them feel like they come in. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And then that really quickly went to, like, that should just be the whole breakdown drop. That's how you should do it. It's, like, super, super um, oral uh, spectral stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I got really into like making things as wide as humanly possible, and then while they're wide, swapping over the sides. So like, there's one tune of mine um, that if you look at the waveform for it, it looks like the waveform turns inside out because oh, it does. Really? Like the whole stereo field rotates wow. and sounds really uh, quite jarring. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was all from this sound design guy from hyper reality. It was like, you can just like twist and mash everything. Um, and a bit of advice from uh, Omar Batu. He's, he was saying like, 
uh i'd I'd send him tunes and then go to time dance so like what do you think he was like yeah yeah, yeah." um and basically i think he just thought they were quite boring so one day he said you've got to make entire tunes around moments like the moment of the tune um but i didn't want the moment to be like an edm drop so the moment was like the freak out of like where everything turns inside out and everything Mm. glitches and everything breaks um because that's what bruce was doing he was like making all his equipment sound like it was melting and like his tunes were like completely demolishing themselves and then coming back in a clever way yes i need to do that the beat going yeah that's i mean well let's let's give a perfect example of that um in we're gonna do a world premiere i think Uh, i don't know if this track has actually been shared but this is um this is actually coming off of your release for us on Redstone Press for the month, and the track is called Put By. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're gonna listen through to the whole song at first, and then we will break it down a little bit with some videos that you've provided, um, and we can focus in on a specific part, and you can talk about how you've created that sense of hyper-reality and drama in the track that we've just discussed, basically. Cool. It is Put By.
excellent 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 <laughs> i love it i every time i hear it it's, it still sounds like i've been well, we, we've been sat on this for bloody ages now haven't we yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it feels like it feels like forever but i mean i'm glad we've waited because hearing that just now like the especially there's that 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 second kind of breakdown towards the end in the last kind of two thirds where there's the, where there's that kind of silence and space where the before the whoosh comes in and it almost sounds like um like a bell off of an old wooden ship or something being clanged in the night like the dun, 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 like yeah oh, it's a cow bell kind of ticky tacky sounds coming in afterwards it just it does it for me like I can't wait. I'm, I'm, <laughs> dying to play it and i uh I'm, i've got a couple of gigs coming up so it's gonna get absolutely hey, well, um, thanks very much. no no i mean thank you i mean you're the one fighting <laughs> music so i thought we could um like say we'll um discuss a little bit about a specific part of that track um yes. we're gonna stay in the video this time and you can talk over a little bit about the makeup of that moment and ex explain how you did it with the context of hyper reality and sound design okay cool cool Oh, that's the intro of the track. That's the main synth that's just the stock retro synth going through yeah. ton of reverb. Um, I quite like stacking all of the logics um, with bulk effect. It's got really weird property, especially the cheap reverbs like the PT verb, sorry, platinum verb. Well, yeah, so that's the main rumble of the sub, and that's just the stock African kick. It goes through a bunch of pitches later on, but it's uh, filtered down so it's got no low end. Um, what we've got here, that's the clicky snare, reverb snare, and then yeah. the clicky snare above it. That's the hi-hat. This is the hi-hat that was sampled, so we've got multiple clicky clacky layers of the drawing. <laughs> so this is the first drop. Yeah. We've got making up the kick. We've got, I always have a clicky one at the top, then the main one going through bus 10. Um, and then, what was the, oh yeah, yeah. So this was sampled off an old UK garage record, that 24 hour experience kit. I think it's from the track together. Right. Um, so again, we've got clicky kick, main kick, sub kick. Usually I've got like a ton of rumble, but all, all of the rumble is so rich coming from that African kit. I basically yeah. pitched down bongos. So dry, they sound like this. Then they get filtered to get rid of that tricky bit in the top end and make way for the low end. Uh, it's still getting side chain against the kick, as is the sub. And we've got multiple layers to get different properties from them. So we've got some more high frequency resonance and then big low frequency um, rumble. I think they're really getting crushed through a limiter as well. So they sound really thick. Yeah, right. Yeah. And we got all, yeah, with this kind of stuff, which is sort of like the reality kind of stuff. Now, this is the main moment of the tune. This is inspired by Bathia's advice, yeah. where there's a pitch shifter. Logic is terrible at pitch shifting. Um, it gives you all these horrible, buggy elements. So you can hear it's going like out of time. It sounds quite glitchy, really digital. And this is just to show I would do massively wide and then go straight to more. You can see how mono that drop is. Yeah, and it just ch channels all that focus into that moment. Yeah, just to sound hyper pressurized. And then little tricks like taking a little bit more snub out, turning it down to and turning it back up on the drop. These are DJing tricks, really. Yeah. Taking the bass out and turning it down. Then we start to mash it up more and more. And you can see how like off the grid it is. It's not in time. Yeah. I think I bounced it in place there because it was glitching quite a bit and I had to click the best bits and compile them and add add little extra uh, resonant flavors, little moments. Wow, there's so much going on. Yeah, it's been about to get the record and it puts down. That's the horrible pitch effect. Um, I'd really recommend anyone with logic to knock about with that because it really? doesn't lay the way it should. It's good, but 
take a bit well, of control just, away yeah, from it. You know, like the, the 303 and the 909 and all that kind of stuff, they were designed for a completely different purpose. And they yes, were used yeah, yeah. in the way that they weren't designed to and have exemplified something completely new. <laughs> so this is turning up the pitch and stuff to make it... You can hear all the transients. Good, good, good. So, uh, uh, so they start to sort of roll and glitch. And that's turning the reverb onto the full and having the reverb go through a pitch effect to sound like it's pitching up. A really good stock plug-in with Logic is the amp pedal board. Um, and that's got a pitch pedal in it. So you can turn things up two octaves or down two octaves. And it sounds horrific. <laughs> like it's really bad quality. Yeah, but, but that's, I mean, that's why I really like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So these are all the snares we've got going on. Um, so that typical meme of the snare just never sounds good. So it's just stacking and stacking and stacking until it's like, you want the most brutally simple snare, but they're the trickiest ones to make. That's something that didn't make the final cut. <laughs> That's your cowbell. Yeah. And this is keeping in the theme of the whole tune, of just isolating frequencies, making them really resonant and then slowly opening them up. So it always sounds like it's progressing. Yeah. That's one of my favorite things to do is put reverb on full and put it through a tremolo to make it start to blend in with the hi hat. Yeah. Yeah. It, a, really, it, really adds, it really adds something in that moment when you when it starts to line up with it. It yeah. Oh, thanks, John. Then everything starts to stop them out. And I think the only time I use that ozone imager on the master is here at the end where uh, the synthesizer comes back on with the full uh, reverb and the whole tune gets monoed and uh, high passed. Wow. Um, that, is, that, was, that was like the quickest whistle stop uh, <laughs> <laughs> description of a very complicated process, which <laughs> we were we, like, and we, as you may tell, we haven't rehearsed that bit, but that was no. <laughs> amazing. Like, it's amazing to look in, like, into get like a look behind the curtain, basically, of what your what your process is and how you utilize tools within Logic to create what the, well tools that uh, to uh, with a use that they're not designed for, essentially. Um, and adding adding this kind of sense of drama to the music through kind of yeah, but like you say, like stretching things out and and using things in their not intended purpose and creating creating expansive sounds through layering on layering on layering of extra bits and bobs. It like I'm not I'm not doing it justice the way I'm talking about it, but. <laughs> It's uh, it's truly amazing. Like I'm, I'm, I was glued there, like to fit, trying to figure out what it is that you're doing, uh -huh. uh, and I, you can really tell the sense of hyper reality with the, the kind of the whoosh coming in, and then it's stopping. It, everyone who hears that will expect something straight away. Yes. And then yeah, yeah, yeah. Right away coming, and then the the cowbell, you know, and the kick coming in at that moment, like it, it arrests your attention whether you like it or not. Oh, and that's, that's such a hook that works on the on the dance floor and also translates to just listening pleasure as well. Do you know what I mean? Like it's nice to be challenged in that moment, and it doesn't really conform to, uh, like you say, like everything's kind of slightly out of time and not 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 quantized exactly. And that it, it kind of reminds me more of classical music in that way because it doesn't conform to a strict kind of time signature. I mean, it does. Mm. It is four four, but. When even with one of the other tracks um, on the EP, when I try and hum, like when I'm humming it to myself, I'm constantly getting it wrong and out of time because it is slightly out of time. So when I'm trying to recreate it in my mind, I'm I'm following a certain time signature and that pushes it out, <laughs> which is really interesting. And I'm constantly trying to figure that out. <laughs> it's super interesting. That's Kirkstone Pass. That's the one I'm okay. like, yeah, <laughs> the, the, the synth stabs in that. Well. We'll, um, we're, we're we're rambling, but um, yeah, no, that's that's amazing. And for anyone who um, is interested in any of the stuff Henry's talked about with regard to sound design and Michael McGee, was it? Marshall. Marshall McGee. Marshall McGee. We're going to be. We'll, what we'll do is we will pop um, we'll pop links to some of his videos in the YouTube description when this gets uploaded. 
um, and that way anyone who wants to who wants to check out the upload there'll be some resources there to check out and we'll send some we'll pop some links for par avion and some of henry's previous work as well um now i am aware that we have sadly run out of time and i feel like we could have chatted onwards and onwards forever um but i say this every time and it always i i never get it right it's been what 10 or 11 sessions and i still have not been able to plan it because <laughs> everyone's been so interesting that i've not wanted to stop talking um but yeah i'd just like to say thank you so much henry once again your insight and your knowledge and your experience are all vital and and really interesting and i hope that people who've been tuned in have been able to pick something up from that um <laughs> Henry will be releasing, as I've said, his um, debut EP with us, uh, Redstone Press, next month. Um, and for anyone who'd like to hear any more sneak peeks, um, we have them on our SoundCloud, on Redstone Press, um, on SoundCloud. And it's also on Rubberdub, their website. Um, it's up for pre-sale at the moment. Um, and also just keep an eye on Henry's social media platform, mine, and Redstone Press for anything coming up. Um, as I mentioned at the start, this is the last session of the AMP Music Program, um, and I'd like to thank all my guests. So we've had Rachel Williams, aka Ambient Babe Station Meltdown, Ian DPM, Bonsai Bonner, Siobhan Wilson, Ira Osborne, Genevieve Taylor, Laura Johnson, Mark Maxwell, and of course, Henry. Um, all the sessions are available to watch back at your leisure on YouTube, and we'll be posting a link in the chat just now for that. Um, I hope you've been able to take something from these sessions and have found insight into your own creative practice, career and passion. And if you have any questions for any of the people who have featured on these uh, sessions in these programs, don't hesitate to reach out. They're all lovely people and they would all love to share their experience and knowledge with you. Um, as for myself, that is the same. I have learned a huge amount and have taken a lot from this. Um, so even if an old dog like me can, then definitely people who are just starting out i definitely recommend tuning into these um thanks again henry um we Thank will you. not be back again unfortunately we will be doing a online end of series event with a lot of the other participants in different parts of the program um but more news will be on our finton bay arts page in the near future on that um thanks again for watching creating work and working creatively it's been a finton bay arts led initiative run by myself and uh steve gasgarth so massive thanks to him as well um, and yeah. thank you henry and thank we will much. i will see you hopefully in london in the next couple of months in fact yes, i'm down at the end of the month so let's grab a coffee wicked yeah please all right thanks everyone all right see you see ya.